that's the recording started. Um, thank you ever so much for coming, everybody. Um, we are uh, the ALT South group. Um, there's me, I'm Lucinda, and Secretary. Um, uh, Manish is the chairperson who's here with us as well. Um, and Edith is also here, does a lot of the communication for us. We are looking for more members to get actively involved. Um, and we've got a couple of projects coming up as well. Um, so please, if you're interested, uh, bob your email in the chat and we can come back to you with some more details of what we've got going on. Um, but today, what we have going on is uh, an old colleague of mine, Tom Peroni, who is now with the Open Data Institute, is going to talk to us about, um, well, really about the bigger picture uh, and the worries around AI, um, with all this stuff taking off with ChatGPT and Bard and the various others. Um, so Tom's been in higher education for 10 years. He's been everything, basically. He's been a teacher, a technologist, a designer, an academic developer. Um, he's a senior fellow of uh, Advance HE, and his big interests are really ethics and responsible data use. Uh, as I said, he's currently at the ODI and he's helping organize all sorts of organizations. Um, if you were here earlier, he was talking about civil service, but I think it's, it's everyone big and small um, to use data more effectively and probably knowing Tom more ethically as well. So Tom, over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Tom, uh, I work at the ODI. I worked in higher ed before. That that is pretty much the kind of uh, deal. Um, I suppose I've I've come here today. Lucinda offered uh, invited me uh, to to come and speak and and offer these kinds of thoughts. And the kind of subject area then is is kind of unpicking these concerns. And it's as Lucinda said, taking this kind of higher level view. I'm not going to wax lyrical around everything that you could do at a granular level. We all kind of work in these different practices, and I'm not naive enough to to think that there aren't different uh, struggles that you have as as academics teaching within these institutions with all of these systems in and around you. As I say, you know, 10 years in, in higher ed, I experienced it quite a lot uh, myself. Um, but I'm gonna jump straight in. And as a bit of a, you know, as all good teachers uh, who don't actually have an answer for the question uh, being raised, I'm gonna, just gonna give you a moment to think of the answers for yourselves. Um, what are your concerns? Throw them in the chat, just take a moment. I'm just going to hold here for a second. When it comes to generative AI, chat, GPT, we'll use them all as synonyms. We'll keep it simple. Um, I don't particularly mind. We'll just take a broad level on it. But do you have concerns? What are they? So we've got elements of trust. Trust in data is, is one of the big issues when it comes to data. It is something that we'll pick through today. What if it gets too good? I mean, I suppose that depends on your definition of what too good looks like. How do we define good? How can we match the pace of change? How can we detect if it's used? How teaching will change? We're not teaching students how to use it properly. There's kind of issues within there that cover all these different elements around teaching and learning rubbish in rubbish out but just because you put good in doesn't mean you get good out enhancing learning equality bias yes critical thinking skills assistive technology yep unfairly penalized there's loads of stuff i'm not going to read them all out to you um i am feeling quite good uh, because a lot of this does kind of come into what we're going to cover and i thought i'd just start here so yes, we are in a crisis. This is an opinion piece published in Inside Higher Ed. So generated text, growing apathy, posts as a catch-all for assignments, discussion forums, whatever kind of text generated input students have, they sound suspiciously AI generated. My challenge there is just because they sound it, are they? Is that our own bias? Is that our own fears coming through? Are we being increasingly less trusting of our students? 
when it comes to these broader practices then is higher ed truly going to look the other way as our students collectively stop engaging with our curricula well who says they are is that again just another element of our fear coming through and is generative AI really the reason why people would disengage with the curricula? There's a comment that's immediately come through uh, from Mike, similar issue to Wikipedia before it came checked and moderated. There's all of these different conversations. I mean, there's lots of stuff here around, you know, we've always kind of been worried about the next best thing, the next technology. And chat G GPT, the kind of issue we've got here is that it's just scaled up massively the access to it is so much easier but what are we actually looking at then generative ai a definition this is super simple i'm keeping it quite high level i'm not going to get into all the nuance of the technologies but it's focusing on generating new content text images sounds whatever or data by le learning patterns from existing data sets now, there's several comments coming through in the chat about it reflecting the current world. And the problem here is that what does the current world look like? Who designed the current world? Because shock horror, the data sets that exist reflect that current world. But whose world? So how did we get here from point A to point GPT? I saw uh, a, a presentation done uh, by an old colleague of mine, uh, Marae Pratch, um, who is now the chair at, in digital education at the University of Manchester. She did this talk as part of uh, a, a setup with Anthology, so the Anthology, the, the makers of, or the owners now of, of, of Blackboard. And it came through these different waves, so the five waves that come through in this innovation element. So we started off with water power, textiles, iron. We went steam, rail and steel, electricity, chemicals, petrol engines, uh, petrochemicals and so on. We're going through these things. And as you can see, each of those waves are getting shorter and shorter. The actual picking up of these practices, the evolution of these technologies are, are happening at such a faster pace. Now, I put the uh, YouTube link for Maraid's uh, talk in there so you can watch the whole thing, but her talk is very simply titled Riding the Tsunami, Chat, GPT, Generative AI, and Digital Education. And we touch on all these things. Now, these things are not new. They've been around. Anybody who's kind of got an interest in digital education will have seen these things. I'm not gonna explain what they all are, but the one that we're kind of majorly concerned about at the moment is this generative AI element, chat GPT, what can it do? Now, riding the tsunami, keeping on this element of waves, well, it's getting faster and faster. So how fast is that wave? One million users, five days. So much quicker than any other technology that's come before it. And with that increase in use, it's had the increased media attention. We've found that you know users across all these different sectors are picking it up. Lots of platforms have gone in with the race to the bottom of how they can embed chat GPT into their systems or other generative AI systems. I was recently working with a colleague who works in marketing uh, using HubSpot. HubSpot is uh, one of kind of the big CRM systems. Now, great, they've thrown generative AI into there so you can start marketing your, your products, writing emails and communications out to your uh, customers far easier. Okay, but what happens to the creative aspects of marketing? And the same premise kind of applies across all of these different areas. So we're already seeing it changing employment. We're seeing it change the, the, the role of, of professionals across these different sectors. But what are institutions doing about it? What about the kind of university approach? We've got responses to rapid change. What was it, the 1st of November last year? It was sometime in November, wasn't it? Chat GPT got released. Uh, we're in May now, and it's seemingly the only thing that anybody's really talking about. Um, but what are institutions doing about it? We've had less than a single academic year, uh, and mostly they're either banning it or they're using it. Um, 
there is a nod then to the third option, which is uh, ask students not to use things that give them an unfair advantage. So we don't have the detail of what that means. Now, I'd like to share this example with you. This is one from UCL. So UCL went forward and they co-designed principles for using generative AI and they co-designed it with their students. But ultimately I felt when I was reading this that you could take the letters AI out of it and it would still by and large sit pretty cleanly in any assessment principles that we might have. You might have to do a few little changes, I appreciate that, but ultimately relevance. Teaching and assessment is designed to prepare students for life and work. Okay, literacy, students understand what the purpose of assessment is. Okay, cool. Tools that can enhance their learning practice. Okay, cool. This is all stuff that has been said before. AI is not really that different in the grand scheme of things. The practicalities of where it is a little bit different. We've got academic integrity and scholarship. Great. Well, okay, cool. We're just asking students not to cheat. That's, you know, I'm being a little bit facetious there, but we're asking students not to cheat. Apply their own criticality. The clarity then, actively engage with students, communicate policies. Okay, cool. Well, tell them what they can and can't do. Great. Fairness. We've been discussing fairness in academia for many, many moons. Data sets have never really been that fair. You only have to look at cardiology research and understand that the data sets that exist in cardiology are massively skewed. They're massively skewed because the data is more about men than it is women. Women are failing to get the right diagnoses and the right treatments. Throwing AI on top of that issue is not going to solve the problem. It's going to perpetuate it even further. But then you take that step back and you go, okay, who's doing the research? Who's peer reviewing the research? Who's getting published? Fairness has always been a problem. So within all of these things, okay, well, what, what are we actually trying to say here? What are the principles telling us that we need to approach with our students? Redesign your assessment. Cool. There we go, problem solved, redesign your assessment, stop doing things where students can just generate it in an essay format. Pretty, pretty ropey suggestion on how to fix the issue, because ultimately this is what we're already doing. I appreciate there's a lot of essay based assessments that are knocking around and there's a lot of things. There's a, there's a good place and a bad place. Again, you know, I've, I've worked in academic development, I've worked in learning design. I know the complexities of these things and I appreciate there are good reasons to use the different modalities of assessments, but by and large, is an essay always appropriate? No, does an essay open yourself up for it to be generated using AI? Yes. Is that always a problem? No, it's more about how we facilitate that practice. So we get into this discussion again around authentic assessment. Okay, well, what is authentic assessment? How to think, not what to think. We give students the subject matters and they construct their ideas in and around that. We go beyond the didactic here. Here you go. This is what you need to know. Go away and learn it. We get those cognitive processes and we hit that golden stage, that constructivism piece, the word that I don't know, ed techies like to throw onto stuff, certainly salespeople in ed tech and go, well, we've got a discussion forum, therefore we're doing uh, constructivism. Great. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about when it comes to authentic assessment. It's going to be different depending on what your subject area is. So providing opportunities for students to engage with workplace skills. It's not just about the subject matter. It's understanding how it applies in context beyond their academic studies. It's balancing the two. There is benefits and transferable skills in the academia, but there is also the application to the practices they will employ in life. Cool. Great. Skills, competencies. 
building those metacognitive skills then great lifelong learning going beyond university what happens when they get outside of that formal structure where do they go how do they continue to develop and make sure they're not left behind there's fluidity to the learning it happens constructively over time great students seek out new information they engage more so with their peers who come with different perspectives and you've got this construction then of unique responses, complex problems, higher order reasoning. It's all the buzzwords that we've seen in research for, for many, many moons. Reflection on action, self-assessment, building self-efficacy. Again, all of those lovely buzzwords. I've just seen that Manish has put in a, a link to authentic assessment. Go away, watch it, try and contextualize it in around what I'm talking about here. So when you're thinking about the authenticity of your assessments, we need to support the building of experiences. We need to support criticality. And what do I mean by that? We start getting into the realms of data skills. When we think about generative AI, when you start looking at what we're asking students and what we're advising them to do, we go, well, you can't just put a question in, throw it into chat. It doesn't really work like that. That doesn't build the experiences. And ultimately then we get it down the realms of going, cool, well, how do we frame that question where I can craft something with chat GPT rather than asking it to do it for me. So how to think and how to think about data. I've got a graph on the screen here. It's got 11 points on it. I'd love for you to draw me a line of best fit in your mind, draw a line of best fit. Where does that line of best fit end up? A, B, C, or D? Pop your answers in the chat for me. So starting on the far left, moving over to the far right, in your mind, where does the line of best fit go? Lots of C's, lots of D's. I think we've got Manish out on the edge with a B. Kareth with a very uh, honest, I have no idea how to begin. I'll ask you another question. Um, what shape is the line? What shape is your line of best fit? Simplest is linear. Got some zigzags. Mostly we've got straight, but we do have that, that comment in there from Mike. Simplest is linear. Now, there you go. There's four trend lines. We'll ignore the fact that quadratic and quartic are a little bit crudely drawn. Um, I was trying to find the original source data for this uh, activity and I've, I've, I've misplaced it, so I've used these. In Manish's point, we've got the average trend line, y equals c, y is a constant, y does not change, therefore we'll see the points as they start to predict the future, they will broadly hit across that straight line. As we go over to linear, now this is where the data science kind of Ugh. 
it's it's all just a bit of a mess with data science because we get into this realm of you know fancy words don't really mean anything linear linear regression what is linear linear is a straight line what is regression it's a relationship between two points it's a straight line between two points if you do any data skills course lots of organizations uh, are starting to put data academies together and when they go through these data academies by and large um you're probably going to be offered an apprenticeship now there's nothing wrong with an apprenticeship but the apprenticeship standards look at this level of statistics and look at this level of maths and data manipulation. And they, by and large, tell you to use linear. But then we've got quadratic. If we go back a slide and actually look at this data, on the y-axis, we've got yield. On the x-axis, we've got salt concentration. This is a data set I took from DEFRA. Now, when the salt concentration in soil increases, the yield exponentially decreases. The answer is D, because it's a curved line moving through those data points. And when we think about this and we think about data and we think about the criticality of how we apply data, every single one of these trend lines is correct. Mathematically, they are correct. They are applied in the correct way. Sandra's point, context is important. Yes, context is important. Salt concentration in the soil, the yield exponentially decreases. If we go ahead with average, then we assume there will never be a drop in the yield over time. If we go with linear, then we're probably waiting until the salt concentration hits about 35 until we get zero. If we go with quadratic, the more appropriate trend line, both accurate and appropriate, we actually see that the yield hits zero when the salt concentration hits about 20. Then we've got quartic. If we go a little bit further than that, we get things like polynomials. Um, these are uh, dreadful, really. Um, all around a little bit difficult. I'm not saying that they're wrong, but what we run into is the keyword that Mike has put in the chat for us. It's overfitting. It stops becoming a line of best fit. It becomes a line of absolute fit. And to illustrate that point a little bit further, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. And again, put your answers in the chat for me. Um, what does a cow look like? Farmyard animal, a cow, what does it look like? broader horse with black and white patches. We've got some of the contextual questions here. Just remember that cows come in different colors, like a bigger dog. Yes. There's all these different views on what a cow is. Now, I don't know enough about cows to really go through all of the complexities of breeds and so on. Small circle face, larger oval body, four legs stick down from its body. Here's my data set of cows. I mean, I'm going to go with Lucy's. Fundamentally, a large mammal with four legs. Here's my data set of cows. Is this not a large mammal with four legs? I don't know whether I have a bull in it, I'll be honest. I've been assured that I don't. I did run this past somebody, but I'm not an expert in cows. Inherit bias, not a black and white cow to be seen. So if we start making decisions based on this data set, well, great, but who benefits? Um, brown cows. So what do we do? We grow uh, that we, we grow the data set, we increase the data set, we add more representation into the data set. Cool, great, here are some more cows. The problem is now I have some 
cow that produces strawberry milk hiding in the middle there. I've got a cartoon. I've got a sign. I've added uncertainty into the data. And what I'm trying to pull here is this, this issue around these large language models, the issues around data. Because if you start making... Sorry, I'm just going to pause for a moment just so everyone can uh, take in the jokes in the chat. When we've got these data sets and when we start making decisions, you know, I'm, I'm illustrating it facetiously here with pictures of cows, but it's this same practice here. If you get into the realm of quartic and polynomials and you have this wiggly line that accounts for every single data point in your data set, then you're being you're being led by outliers in the data. And there's always outliers in the data, but what we don't have is the criticality to identify those outliers. Big data is not better data. How do we define big data? We use words that only begin with the letter V. Volume, how much of it is there, variety, the representation in the data, veracity, the uncertainty in the data, velocity, how fast we can analyze and act upon that data. There's a wonderful link here to a, a short lecture uh, segment. It's only five minutes or so from um, the people at the University of Washington. Uh, they run a course called uh, Calling BS. Um, it's also published as a book. There's also then this, this lecture series on, on YouTube. It's well worth a watch, but the example they use is from 2009. So this stuff isn't new. 2009 isn't that long ago, but we're still having the problems. And what Google looked to do, so this was detecting influenza epidemics using search engine query data. This was Google piling in a shed load of cash and building Google flu trends. Now, they claimed to a level of 97% accuracy that they could predict a flu outbreak across the US. The problem is they overfit the data. They were led by the outliers because what happens when you use search terms? Well, you search for a headache. You search for, I'm feeling a little bit snotty. You search for, I'm a little bit achy. But they are symptoms of so many other things. And just because you're searching those symptoms doesn't mean you've got them. They included all of the outliers. They included all of the data. In actual fact, they predicted the past, not the future. And the problem with that, they still only predicted the past to an accuracy level of 97%. So they didn't even predict the past correctly. In terms of the uh, evaluation rate of their system, the confidence was 97. The evaluation rate was actually somewhere around the 40s. It was massively lower. They were worse than a guess. The one key insight that they took away from the data um, was that most flu outbreaks happen in September and October, um, which is all good and all, but essentially Google spent a shed load of money producing this algorithm to detect flu outbreaks or to predict flu outbreaks, sorry and they predicted the start of the school year. Mike, a question in the chat, why is future same as the past? Well, it isn't, and that's the problem. And this is where having 100% confidence is not actually the right thing. You wanna lower that confidence, mainly so you can avoid outliers in the data set. This is where criticality in the data comes through. We can have data skills, but we also need data literacies. So what happens when humans learn bad habits? We used to say that the danger existed between hacking skills, and we don't mean computer hacking, we're talking about problem solving here. We used to say that the problems, the danger existed between hacking skills and substantive expertise. But it doesn't, because at least if you've got the substantive expertise in the domain, then you know roughly what, what should be what and what good looks like. You can define good much more accurately than other people. But if you have somebody with really strong maths and statistic knowledge and the ability to solve a problem, but without that substantive expertise, crop yield, salt concentration, I wasn't, you know, I, I was hoping nobody in, in this room would have a, a, a strong understanding of farming, um, because otherwise the example would have been a bit useless. But without the substantive expertise in agriculture, then you apply linear to it. 
There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not necessarily appropriate. And this is what we're seeing applied into the generative AI systems, hacking skills, maths and statistics, knowledge, substantive expertise, the skills that make up a data scientist. A priori, a posteriori, reasoning by logic, reasoning by experience. These generative AI systems are reasoning by logic. We're trying to build our students to reason by experience. And this is where universities come in to build the substantive expertise, develop that critical thought. So let's look at the broader examples then. AI, really good at designing knitwear. Um, this was a fashion show. Uh, all of the outfits then designed using AI. Uh, don't look too uh, closely. Um, but the belt, the belt doesn't actually function. What we've actually seen here is not just a fashion belt that hangs upon your waist. Um, the actual, uh, what do you call it, the buckle, um, isn't attached to one half. That that belt is hanging in midair. It's approximated all the things that a belt is meant to be. It doesn't even function as a piece of material. Go a bit further then, more terrible examples. Can AI support accurate diagnoses? So when it comes to skin cancer, individuals with non-white skin are less likely to develop skin cancer, but have lower survival rates. Can AI solve the problem? No, AI cannot solve the problem because when we start using these generative models and using all of these images in the training set, we're perpetuating the bias that exists. This particular example, 63,000 images in the training set, only five to 10% of them are from non-white patients. Things like ChatGPT, it's exactly the same. It's the generalized view of the world. Who's produced that view of the world? Generative AI democratizes access, not representation. Picture of the British Museum there. The example that I would use here is great. You can get into the British Museum for free. You can get into many museums in London for free, many museums across the UK for free. Great, we've democratized the access. But what about what's inside? horrible to see all the loot. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's Britain's colonial past, Britain's colonial present. But it's okay, because at least we're letting people see it. Let me illustrate it in a different way. What does your network look like, A or B? Both largely look the same on the surface of it. It's because they are. But what happens when we start breaking down the connections in those networks? Think of all the people that you can speak to, the expertise you can pull upon, the acquaintances that you can pull upon, the people you have met at a conference once or twice, the people you've seen speak that you can go and reach out to. You are able to apply your critical skills, your knowledge of context, your understanding of context, and explore that in more depth. Got the logic by reasoning. Uh, and logic by experience. Your experience is what drives you. The logic by reasoning is more akin to what we're seeing in B there. We go down the lines. When it comes to learning then, learning happens in the space between people. It's the importance of these networks that we build. This was from a talk I was at the Learning Technologies Conference um, at the start of May. This was Dr. Nigel Payne. This was a quote from, from one, of the, one of his talks. Now, from an ODI perspective, we have this, the data skills framework. 
Now, it's a skills framework, not a competency framework. We don't necessarily have the component skills and knowledge areas that underpin every single one of these hexes. We do have courses that kind of fit across some of these, but again, not all. So it's not entirely comprehensive. It's there to be adapted for your purposes. But what we're seeing down the central column from introducing data down to leading change is what we call the core. Having some understanding of data, being, under, uh, being knowledgeable in how data creates value and how to create value with data, finding insights, developing strategy, leading change, taking those insights and developing new knowledge, making decisions. On the right hand side, in the green and the purple, we have our data practitioner skills, people who are working directly with the data, the slightly more technical people, we might say. On the left hand side, in the pink, the orange and the yellow, we have our more strategist area. More of the soft skills, understanding the processes, the operations of organizations and how these things move forward. Now, what we advocate for is a balance. How can you make decisions if you can't be critical of the data? How can you be critical of the data if you don't understand some of the skills that are applied? How can you apply the skills if you can't be critical of what you're outputting? Works both ways. So with all this in mind, should we stop using generative AI? I don't think so. We have this schools-based mindset. We are the teachers. We need to impart knowledge. Don't go and get it from somewhere else because that other source isn't as good as me. That then assumes that learning is purely content consumption. That didactic approach here is information. Read it, internalize it, remember it. But if we rely too heavily on chat GPT, rely too heavily on this democratization of access without applying the appropriate level of criticality, we run the risk of creating a society of functional illiterates. So democratization of access, but it's missing that democratization of representation. And if we don't start looking for that and we don't start being critical of it, well, it's just kind of, you know, plug in the numbers, hope for the best. It's a bit like going into a maths exam without a, well, without a, without a knowledge of how a calculator works. It's that same kind of thing. Complain a lot about students using calculators. But in reality, you've still got to understand how to use the calculator effectively. Difference between literacy and skills. Here's a question for you. What's the average salary in the UK? If you think you've got an answer, pop it in the chat. Now, I will apologize because I am a disgraceful pedant. Um, it's a bit of a trick question. What's the average salary in the UK? Mike, you've hit the nail on the head, the mean, the median, or the mode. And generally speaking, none of you are that far off. But the problem with the average, there isn't a single average. There's three, the mean, the median, and the mode. In any given population, salaries are positively skewed. The mode, the median, and the mean are all different. The modal salary in the UK is about 24. The median salary in the UK is about 32. The mean salary in the UK is about 38. In order to use the word average, the mean, the median, and the mode need to be the same. We need the normal distribution. We need the bell curve. So if your data sets aren't normalized, the word average doesn't carry any weight because it's wrong. There are three measures of average. Salaries, modal salary in the UK, 24. Median salary in the UK, 32. Median salary in the UK, 38. BBC usually pretty good when they report stuff. 
they do report the medium when they're covering the RMT strikes. They're they're talking about the medium. There was a point at the start of uh, of the strikes in the summer of last year where the RMT started reporting the average salaries of RMT members. Slightly problematic because there's three averages. They declined to comment which average they were using. Now, in fairness to them, they changed their messaging. They started going with uh, the median, I believe. There was a, a an audience member on Question Time a few weeks ago who said that nurses uh, earn, on average, thirty three thousand, whilst they were um, disagreeing with strike action. Well, you know what? If you feel hard done by because nurses, on average, are earning more than you, then you know that's fair. I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong to feel the way that you feel but the average isn't 33. The mode is the most common, in which case most people in the UK are earning 24. And it's that level of criticality. It's all well and good understanding the maths, but understanding how to interrogate the messages that are coming through. The technical skills that apply to data are just as important as the ability to communicate it appropriately. But when we focus on data skills, we tend to think about the input, not the data input, the human input, the rise of the prompt engineer and why it matters. This is an article um, on the World Economic Forum. Albert Phelps who, is, Phelps, who is a prompt engineer at Accenture. Fastest growing jobs. I mean, we're talking about all these things and you know, should we stop using generative AI? No, I don't think so. If it's going to be one of those things that stick around, and I'm not saying it is, you know, the hype I'm sure will drop at some point, but, you know, it's probably going to stick around in, in some one form or another, in which case we're better off making use of it. If these are the fastest growing jobs, and it's a lot in there around AI and machine learning specialists, similar kind of themes going down the line there. We've got to understand how to be critical. We've got to understand literacies. We've got to go beyond the skills. We can build the data skills, but what about the data literacies? So our key questions then, where is learning accessed? Which content is privileged? What systems and support mechanisms exist for the application? So what do you do about this? Action one, get on board. Cat's out of the bag. Might as well join in. This is ChatGPT's world now, and the best thing you can do is get on board. Use it in your learning, set tasks. Use the outputs from ChatGPT. Work with students to understand how to put messages in, how to put prompts in how to be critical of the output. How can we use that to craft work even further? Leverage it for, for peer marking practice between students. Leverage it for your broader learning activities. With prompt engineering, yes, okay, fine, cool. Yeah, it's great. It makes the output much better. But we need to also be critical of that output. Just because we're putting in better prompts doesn't mean we're getting better outputs. We need to be, we need that balance of both. Relating it back then to the employability, this was a piece of research by Dot Everyone. Unfortunately, Dot Everyone closed their doors in 2020, but before they did, they put out this research. Nearly two thirds, 63% of tech workers want more opportunity to understand the impact of their products. Changing values in the workforce, uh, Workforce Insights, this, this was a report put out uh, by Randstad earlier this year. I wouldn't accept a job with a business that doesn't align with my values on social and environmental issues. Well, okay, generative AI, massive social issues within there. It's just a perpetuation of the social issues that already exist. We're seeing more than 50% of young people and actually still a huge amount, huge proportion of uh, different age groups all agreeing with this statement. Action two, add noise, explore the complex problems, interrogate the domain. Generative AI relies on those existing data sets. They describe the world as it has been designed. If we're not careful, we perpetuate that. 
do your research, explore new topics, be critical, grow the representation, make it more democratic. Narrow data sets, not new. It is power that has allowed unequal appropriations of knowledge and marginalization of other knowledge formations. This article was not written about generative AI. Action three, final action, embed data ethics. Now, I've seen lots of discussions around data ethics and it's, it's an area that I've really become very, very interested in. It's something where I spend a lot of my time exploring now. Now, if we took a view on ethics, then yes, we can get into all of the philosophical discussion. We can take it at that high level and, and interrogate all of the different avenues of investigation. But I'm taking it much more simple than that. What is data ethics as a set of skills? So we've got the definition of data ethics by the ODI on the right hand side there, a branch of ethics that evaluates data, data practices with the potential to adversely impact people and society in data collection, sharing and use. What are the skills that we're applying? What are the literacies that we're applying? The use of generative AI brings an opportunity to learn data ethics in practice, learn the, the underlying skills of data ethics. It's the opportunity to apply new tools to understand the impact of your work. That's kind of everything from me. And I just kind of want to go back through some of the chat and just, I'm just scrolling back up to the top and actually looking at some of those concerns that you raised right up at the start. How can we match the pace of change? Get involved in it. Detecting if it's used. Well, what kind of use are you looking for? Now, if you're going down the route of the design of an essay, then yeah, cool, great. Teaching students to use it properly, teaching students to be critical of it. All of these things, I don't, I'm not gonna sit here and say I've got all of the answers. But there's lots of things that we can do to start smoothing off that wheel but thank you very much thanks ever so much tom that was really interesting and huge amounts to think about certainly for me and i'm sure for others um does anybody have any other questions for tom you can come on the mic and talk to us we've got 10 minutes or so left yeah i, I i've got a question um, the people who are developing this generative AI, Greg Brockerman from OpenAI, and there's an interesting um, interview with Stuart Russell, who was the Reith lecturer. Um, this, and he, I mean, they're saying that the emergent properties of this generative AI, text AI particularly, but all of them, are shocking and surprising the creators. They had no idea it could do what it's doing. Um, and therefore, you know, people are sort of like reverse engineering. They're, they're trying to work out what's going on. And it's not as if there's an instruction booklet. No, I, th I think that's a really, really good point. Um, I mean, I work at the Open Data Institute. Our entire, our entire world is open data. Now you've got open AI open is applied in a slightly different way what's actually happening under the hood well we we don't know we can only trust the messages that we're told now trying to reverse engineer it to explore even deeper okay yeah but how much are people going to find out i'm sure at some point we'll have a much greater working knowledge at the moment we're, we're just kind of firing in the dark a little bit What about bias? Uh, do you want to tell us more? 
Um, yeah, so my sort of question is a lot of the data that's picking up from is available from the internet and there's going to be a bias that it's the population that has access to the internet and um, not the population that doesn't. So obviously systems, you know, it's uh, data in, data out, you know, it's going to have bias, isn't it? Or is it trying to get a head around what it is? Yeah, and it's... The thing is, it's all well and good to have me kind of sitting here and going, hey, it's it's got bias in it. Um, it, it doesn't really kind of explain the scale of, of the issue. We've got to kind of, within this, you know, it's it's understanding what the system's kind of doing and, and working toward whilst also trying to connect that with the bigger picture. So what is happening around the world? We have this incredible growth in the numbers of people who have access to the internet, but they've not, they've not had it yet so what are the stories what's the data that exists even the kind of you know anthropological view of going well this is what i've observed of these people well that's your story of those people not their own story so the bias runs so much deeper than kind of what i've explained here or what I've covered here. Dan, I think you're right. I don't think we can ignore its, its fantastic use cases. It's not just about exploring content areas. Uh, yes, of course, I'll share the slides. I'll share those uh, via you, um, if that's all right, Lucinda. Yep, that's grand. Send them over. We'll uh, pop them up um, and the recording will go up on the um, ALT YouTube page as well if anybody wants to go back and, and have a rewatch. Wonderful. It's an interesting point there, Manish. If you use the engine to remove some of the bias, it can learn. I don't suppose you saw the article in the Times around uh, OpenAI uh, paying a group of people in Kenya absolute pittance to start removing all of the horrible things that ChatGPT was generating in all of the discussion around OpenAI applying ethics. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. Oh, yeah. That doesn't sit well, does it? No. <laughs> Which is, the, more, the more you look at data and the more you look at data ethics, uh, the more sad you get. Um, <laughs> yeah. A wonderful view on the world. So anybody else, any more questions or comments before we wrap it up? Well, once again, thank you ever so much, Tom. That was really good. Really appreciate your time um, as well. Um, for everybody else, do keep having a look. We do run uh, talks normally about one a month, um, although we may slow down a bit for the summer. Um, and we're currently looking at what we'd like to offer for next year as well. So if there's anything that you would really like to um, see or get involved with, um, then please do um, get in touch with um, ALT South and we will see what, what we can do. Um, you can sign up to the group as well if you haven't on the ALT website and um, we've got a JISC mail. Um, that would keep you up to date with everything we've got going on. So thanks ever so much, everybody. Thank you.
I'm just seeing everybody slowly leave. Um, <laughs> <coughs> I can remember when I first used this, I couldn't work out how to get out. Let me just stop the recording as well. That would be useful, wouldn't it?